What's up, guys? Welcome to part four of my classic childhood VHS collection. Check out the, the original trilogy right here on my channel, where I take a look at every single nostalgic movie from the 90s and the 2000s. My childhood. So let's keep going, because I have the greatest VHS childhood collection. See Spot Run. I totally remember this from my childhood. And it was one of those films that they tried to make like a big hit back in the day, and it wasn't really one. But, I mean, it, it was entertaining. This was back in the day, back in like the 90s and the early 2000s, when dog movies actually used to be good. But this one I remember just being decent. I mean, it had like some cheap jokes in it and all that. And this is before like the 2010s ruined the dog movies with all the fucking pause movies and all that shit. And back in the day, Warner Brothers had a really good uh, track record of making animated feature films in kids' movies. I, I do remember laughing at this as a kid, but I have not seen this movie in, like, fucking Christ. I haven't seen this film in, like, probably 15 years or longer. <laughs> Fruit Loop, the Fruit Loops on his head. I mean, these pictures together are hilarious. Uh, the blonde guy in this movie kind of reminded me of Owen Wilson, but it's not Owen Wilson, of course. But it's you know, it's kind of funny about this film is that it, it never became popular, so it's actually like trapped in time, kind of like him on the on the cover here in the dog cage. Looking back at uh, childhood movies now as an adult, it's like now I can relate to it as an adult. So I I can relate to his frustration, you know, having this job, trying to take care of this dog and all that shit. But as a kid, I never really thought of it that way. I just never had that kind of perspective. You can actually still watch this on, like, Amazon Prime. The smart one isn't wearing any pants. <laughs> so funny. Funny joke. <laughs> Next, we have the all-time classic Peter Pan. Now, once again, like I mentioned in my other uh, VHS reviews, is that there are older Disney films from, like, the, the 50s and stuff like that that were not released uh, in my time period in the 90s, but they were re-released on VHS, so it's, like, 90s to, like, people my age. Because I remember watching Peter Pan a lot on VHS as a kid. What's interesting about this particular case that I have is that this seems to be printed off a computer because someone has lost the uh, original art for this. This looks like it's like, I don't know where I bought this, I don't remember, but Peter Pan is a very good movie. It's one of the classic Disney films, and it, it's one of those classic animated feature films. And you know what's weird is that the origins of the real Peter Pan, at least in like in folklore and the occult, is like very like satanic and stuff. And yet, here, here Peter Pan is presented as, like, this cheery, nice boy, and he's, like, the hero and everything of the kids. And it's, like, the folklore of Peter Pan is nothing like that. So, of course, it's classic, you know, uh, uh, satanic Disney, you know, changing the evil origins of a character and making them good. And it's, like, tricking people and all that. It's, like, of course, very, you know, deceptive, classic Disney. And, you know, this is the original Peter Pan, and there's been so many different other versions of Peter Pan that came out. Like, I remember there was a sequel, then they had that disgrace of them mocking Peter Pan in the new uh, Chippendale movie. And that movie sucked, by the way. But I'll talk about that in another video. The THX certified, I mean, THX used to be a big deal back in, like, the late 90s and the 2000s. They used to be like, oh, they, like... They were pride of themselves on being the highest quality of, of, of video format. And then it was really funny because once HD hit the scene in the 2010s, it's like no one gave a fuck about THX anymore. But I used to always love that intro that they used to always have for THX. That THX intro was so memorable, and it always made me think of watching Star Wars on tape and everything. But now, like, THX is just a memory. It's a memory of the past, of when that used to be special. But I, I don't even like HD. I mean, I do a little bit, but I, I mostly hate HD because I, I, I like it when it looks fuzzy. I like it when it looks old school looking. I, I, that's just my preference, and... Um, I'm not going to change the way I feel just because it's popular to think of it in a different way. Now, this is like the 90s re-release of Peter Pan on VHS for the 45th anniversary. 
And I remember they had toys at McDonald's at the time. It kind of felt like Peter Pan, the original, was new again. New for the 90s. This Tuesday, you'll believe in magic again when Walt Disney's masterpiece, Peter Pan, comes to video. Fantasy and adventure. Woo. In a special 45th anniversary limited edition you'll want to own. Hooray! He really is wonderful. Walt Disney's Peter Pan on video. Amazing. Hurry, this timeless classic is available from Disney for only 45 days. For those of you dinosaurs who still remember those old uh, McDonald's Disney toys... The Quest for Camelot. This is a, it's, it's a pretty good movie. For some reason, it gets a pretty bad rap nowadays. But once again, it's Warner Brothers competing with Disney. Sure, this film doesn't hit the mark in all the right areas, but it's still a pretty good movie. And the dragons were the best part of the film. They were the funniest part. And they did remind me of like kind of Disney characters you'd see. And this is very Disney-esque, but it's Warner Brothers' version. I remember this came out like a year or something after Space Jam, and it's like Warner Brothers was really trying to cash in on the, the kids' movie stuff with the animated feature films and really compete with the fucking empire known as Disney. And Disney were amazing at making, at making animated feature films, but people always forget all these other companies like Warner Brothers and all these other companies that, that made their own great animated cartoon films back in the 90s. It wasn't just fucking Disney, you know? This had very good songs in it, I remember. And the villain was also pretty memorable. Oh, what I could be if there was only me. Oh, what I'd do if I didn't have you. Quest for Camelot. I can see it all now. Cornwall and Devon starring. You mean Devon and Cornwall? That's it. I want separate contracts. I always, I always loved it when they re-aired this on Cartoon Network's Cartoon Theater back in the day. Welcome to Cartoon Network's Cartoon Theater. Turbo! A, the Power Rangers movie. Now, this is, this is the second Power Rangers movie of the official ones. Um, and, you know, this is when Turbo was going on. And this film may have been the introdu introduction to Turbo. This film got a lot of mixed reviews when it came out. And even from fans... Because I, you know, I rewatched it as an adult, and it's like it's not as good as I remember it. But this is when Power Rangers, in my opinion, was starting to get stale. I loved the older stuff, like the original and Zio, and even in space and stuff like that. But Turbo, I remember they had an N sixty four game too. That was a pretty crappy game, but that should have been way better. But anyway, we're here to talk about the Turbo movie. Say what you want about the Turbo show, but. The movie was very mixed. I, I think it was decent from what I remember, but it just kind of felt like an extended version of an episode. And it's like, that's not what you want. This is supposed to be special. It's the Turbo Power Rangers movie. I think the, the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie, was way better than this. I mean, this should have been way better, in my opinion. And the villain was... Uh, I don't know. She was... Annoying, but uh, the, the Power Rangers villains are supposed to be corny and annoying. But I just think maybe they should have had a better villain in the film. I mean, she still could have been there, but she was a little too over the top. And I know that's kind of weird because we're talking about Power Rangers, right? But there is such a thing as being a little too over the top where you kind of ruin the whole corny thing. And I think she kind of did that in this film. And once again, like the climax was not really that special. And it was interesting and cool when this came out because it's like, oh, finally, we have a second Power Rangers movie. But the film didn't really deliver like the original did, which is a real shame for all the complaints about the new Power Rangers uh, remake reboot movie. And I, I hated a lot of stuff in that movie, which is actually a better movie. The Turbo movie. Or the Power Rangers remake movie. <laughs> now, sure, I guess we'll just say Turbo's better. But let me know what you guys think in the comments. You know, it's kind of funny. I think this film is like the last gasp of, like, of uh, Rangers mania. I mean, they were still trying to make them really popular. And they were always popular. But the popularity, in my opinion, they it, it waned, in my opinion. It was not as big as it used to be. It's kind of like Pokemon or other series. Like, it just happens over time. The Lady and the Tramp. 
this is a classic movie. It's very entertaining. Once again, it's like during the time of Peter Pan, you got the THX again. This is like a memorable scene in the film where they're eating the spaghetti. I do like the message of the film because in, in, in some ways it's saying don't judge people based on how much money they have. It's almost saying that. Back in the day, there was this whole movement to make dogs and animal characters humanoid-like. And it was, very, it was extremely popular. And I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong with making them humanoid. I think it's fun. I think it's relatable. And I just don't like it when it goes too far. Now, these two uh, cats at the top, they were the, the Siamese cats in the film. And a lot of people think, looking back, that they're pretty racist. And I think they are, pretty much. But, I don't know. I still found them entertaining in the film. I mean, they never stated anything. The characters never said anything that was racist. But the way they acted was very stereotypical. But this is a film, like, from the 50s or whatever. So, yeah, I don't know. Actually, not too much more to say, except for the animation in the film is really good. Lady and the Tramp 2, Scamp's Adventure. This came out in the 2000s, and this, this, in the 2000s, Disney started making sequels to all their animated films, no matter how old they were. They made, I remember they made Bambi 2 and stuff. I think this is a great movie. I remember this film so well, and I have such fond memories of watching it. Like, I have more memories of watching this than the original. Now, Scamp is the son of the main character from the first movie, and I don't remember his name. I know. What a disgrace of me. I thought this was great. I thought it was relatable, and I, I loved how he looked up to his father in the film. It was so, like, nostalgic, and it was just so awesome, like, the way they did this movie. The way they did this film in the 2000s reminds me of how they did the Dalmatians movies. Like the sons and daughters of the, of the, the original characters. This film kind of felt like the next generation of those original characters from that old movie. And it was a great idea at the time. Animation was great and I, I just think that it's, this is a classic movie that kind of gets uh, overlooked. Like, from this film, like if it was more successful, they could have made uh, Lady and the Tramp 3 and 4 and stuff. And maybe five, but, you know, like The Land Before Time. I, I guess this is underrated, but... And I, I would actually argue it's probably better than the original movie. Let me, let me know if, in the comments if you guys remember Lady and the Tramp 2 in the 2000s when you were growing up. Airbud, <laughs> Airbud is hilarious. This film makes me really nostalgic. It's really weird because <laughs> Irresistible, that's fucking hilarious. So it's a dog that plays basketball. And remember how they had all these they had all these hilarious sequels to Airbud where he did every other sport. He did volleyball, baseball, football. <laughs> I mean, that shit's fucking hysterical. Like how many fucking sports is Airbud gonna be good at? Once again, this is when they start in the 90s. In the 90s, man, the golden age was when they actually had good dog movies. Now, Airbud is a classic. And it's actually better than you think it would be because it's one of the first of its kind where they're trying to do this outrageous idea with the animals. And yes, it's corny like a typical kid's 90s movie should be because the 90s was a very, very corny decade. And some people don't really remember that if you didn't grow up in that time. But all the clothes and the fashion and just, it was a very colorful time period, too, with all the products and everything. And McDonald's and, you know, Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. There was a lot of color and, you know, Gak and Moon Shoes. Air Bud was a big deal at the time, which is pretty funny thinking about that. But, you know, what's weird about this film is that it, it was released in 1997, which is a year after Space Jam. And for some reason, it reminds me so much of Space Jam. The idea of animals playing basketball. I mean, the Looney Tunes were animals and they played basketball, right? And the whole thing of, like, in Space Jam, the Monstars got powers in order to play basketball. And, you know, Air Bud's a dog, he's a creature, and he's jumping up and he's able to shoot the ball and everything. I just think it's, it's a really fun idea if it's, really, if it's done well. If it's done in a really, like, way where they don't, you can tell they don't care that much about the directing and the acting and the presentation of the film and the, and the plot... I think you can make any, Air Bud's a, a classic example is you, you can take any like really extremely stupid idea and if you work really, really hard on it, you can actually make a classic out of it. Air Bud might be one of those films that's like in between good and mediocre, 
I mean, you could say I'm looking at this through rose tinted glasses, but I really think the Air Bud is actually a, a it's a good movie. Um, it just seemed like they cared more in the film. And that scene where the boy tries to get rid of the dog in the film to get rid of Air Bud, and he like walks away from him and the dog keeps trying to follow him that was extremely sad when i was a kid that that made me weep that made me so fucking sad that scene oh my god that was so painful to watch holy shit it reminds me of old yeller that scene a lot of people when they watch this they think of old yeller old yeller's fucked up though because he, he shot the dog <laughs> and and that's not funny but i guess we laugh at old yeller because it's a movie and it's like, it's so outrageous. It kind of comes across like a robot chicken skit or something. Kind of odd how like BK here makes me think of Burger King. Don't talk about fast food too much because then it makes you want to eat it. The legacy of Air Bud and Space Jam. How close are they? They're so similar in my opinion. A lot of people don't talk about that, but there were films that came out before and after Space Jam that were inspired by um, what Space Jam was. And what Space Jam became. Also, the clouds in the background. Like, this cover makes me think of that Michael Jordan poster. Uh, the Space Jam, Michael Jordan poster, and the clouds. And Michael Jordan was known as the Prince of the Air. And I know that there's that new Air movie coming out, but anyway. And that's why in Space Jam, they had the song, I Believe I Can Fly and Fly Like an Eagle. And Air Bo- what's he doing in this cover? He's flying. This cover is, is just like that poster, that Space Jam poster. And another Space Jam poster, too. It's like clouds in the 90s. It was really cool. And the 90s was just a really sunny, colorful time in our lives. It was a quiet, colorful time where we didn't have all these fancy phones and not everyone was on the internet. And it was just different. And it was just, I don't know. And again, like the clouds here remind me of the clouds on the cover for Sea Spot Run. See the clouds? clouds man windows 95 all the cloud stuff the cloud imagery was a, a thing in the 90s and it was really cool it made you think of like heaven and stuff like that fantasia fantasia is shockingly old it's from 19 fucking 40 for god's sakes i have a funny memory about this film when, when, when i was really young and i was had sleepovers with my cousin his dad would always put fantasia on so that he fell asleep <laughs> which is hilarious because fantasia is was extremely boring to watch as a kid and as an adult it's it's definitely of course more watchable i do think fantasia is a little overrated it's not that good the animation is you know great and i do like the colors of the film and i do like the scene with the uh the fawns running around but the stuff with mickey was the best part of the film I mean, it was the most entertaining, and, you know, Mickey's a star. It's like, who are these other stupid characters in Fantasia? Like, the fucking dancing hippos and shit. And the the scene with the devil was pretty cool. By the way, I heard that the devil, his face and mannerisms were based off of Bela Lugosi from, you know, playing Dracula. That blew my mind when I found that out. I mean, it's a rumor, but I think it's true. And it's like, I never would have fucking knew that when I was a kid. I didn't see Dracula when I was a kid in uh, the 1933 Dracula film. But anyway, what's really cool about this tape is it's written in gold, you know. Of all the childhood movies, they were always white. The tapes were always white. And Fantasia, the Disney film, had a black tape. I remember that when I was a kid. It was black. And it was like, ooh, so this is like special. Like, ooh. Wow, the black tape. Ooh, it was like so cool and interesting. And you don't get that kind of thrill anymore. People don't care about physical items anymore. But back in the day when VHS tapes were a big deal, you notice shit like that. Fantasia, yeah, it's entertaining, but it, it was definitely a boring affair compared to the other Disney films. I mean, there is no fucking plot. I mean, there doesn't have to be for it to be good, but... I heard uh, there's a lot of people that like to trip acid or do drugs watching Fantasia, and I can see how that's fun. Maybe I'll do that one day, but this film is so great. We're back, a dinosaur story. Dinosaurs were huge in the 90s, guys. Dinosaurs were a trend, like the clouds I mentioned earlier. 
there was so many stuff with dinosaurs in the 90s and you know jurassic park barney and this this is uh like i think it's an underrated movie looking back because there were people that talked about it at the time but it was just so great and i love the colors like each of the colors it, like it reminds me of the power rangers you know all the different colors of each of the dinosaurs. The animation of this film is amazing. Is amazing. It's really funny, and it's it was really memorable, and it is underrated because you don't get stuff like this anymore, man. Like th this is like the kind of stuff that became became legend over time when we used to have people in an office hand drawing animation, and it looked just phenomenal, and the colors and the '90s and everything. It was just such an amazing time to grow up. And Amblin Entertainment was owned by Steven Spielberg. And you can see Fightful here in the logo. This is a universal film. See? Not Disney. That's right. Not Disney. You know, it would have been awesome if they made a sequel to We're Back. But, unfortunately, it never goddamn happened. Ah, <sighs> yeah. There's something really warm and fuzzy just seeing this cover just brings back all the memories of the film and yeah they don't make them like they used to let me tell you when things used to be a big deal now this is a, such a great movie I, I don't know if it's underrated but because there's, there's a lot of people that love this film and i love it too the great goddamn mouse detective and i think this was an 80s disney movie and the 80s is considered by a lot of animation fans to be called the dark age of disney but whatever. And once again, just like Disney did like an an the animal version of Robin Hood, here they did an animal version of Sherlock Holmes, basically. It also reminds me of, an, of the American Tale movies. Like, the whole thing with animals being like human characters was so like appealing and charming, and especially the way they did it back then. And it's just such a great film, and this is another film that could have gotten sequels. Actually, it reminds me a lot of Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse had a really great intro. It was very catchy, but it was a British cartoon. And I don't know. It just kind of reminds me of this film. They're both very similar. I mean, Danger Mouse was a James Bond parody, but in the 80s. Great mouse detective. Great underrated film. Cinderella. It may seem corny and embarrassing for a guy to admit this, but I loved Cinderella when I was a young boy. And the fairy godmother was really entertaining. And the best part of the film were, were the mice. They were hilarious, and I loved them. And that the cat in the film was named Lucifer. Of course, it's a Disney film. What do you expect? But um, the mice, you know, taking on the cat to get the stuff back in that film reminded me... It was like watching an episode of Tom and Jerry. There's, there's quite a bit of stuff in this film that's not girly. So it, it wasn't exactly that embarrassing to admit that you liked Cinderella back in the day because Cinderella has a lot of things that aren't just the typical, you know, girl bullshit. And it was funny and the mice were the greatest part of the film and also the, uh, the king or whatever. He was pretty funny. I remember rewatching this film like 10,000 times when I was a kid, just over and over and over again. That's what it was like to grow up in the 1990s, guys. You just rewatch the tape over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I loved how the mice called her Cinderella. I just loved them. I just loved the mice and the adventures they had in the film of helping out Cinderella. That's the thing about certain animated films is like, in some of these films, like the animals... When, when it's a film with the animals and the human characters, sometimes the animals are, there are better characters in the film than the human stuff. Because sometimes the human stuff is just a little too stereotypical. That's Cinderella. Bambi. We can have a whole debate, like, what's a better movie, Bambi or Cinderella? Anyway, anyway Bambi is a classic movie. It's really good. You know, it's, it's, it's memorable and... I remember people being confused whether Bambi was a boy or a girl. And also, people were confused, especially about Thumper, whether he was a boy or a girl. And um, the skunk, I forget his name. What a disgrace, I don't remember his name. Flower, that was his name. Yeah, uh, people were confused if Flower was a boy or a girl watching the film. Yeah, lots of gender confusion watching this film. But anyway, it was entertaining. I loved Thumper, and I loved Flower. I think Thumper and, and Flower were actually more entertaining than Bambi, but it was still a good movie, and it was relatable because of the stuff that Bambi went through in the film, especially 
for those of you, you know, just this, the stuff with Bambi's appearance and everything, <laughs> you know, I have a funny story. Uh, back in the day I had this teacher and he was, he was a real character and he, he was always really pissed off at the students. Kind of funny. I actually became really close with him. But anyway, he, he got pissed off because we're, uh, our, our, the other teacher in the other room was retiring. And during her retirement, she kept showing us Disney films every time we went into her class. And she didn't care. She didn't care about teaching. So every time we went into his classroom and he was a math teacher, he'd be like, you guys are going into high school. You're going into high school. You're not, okay, you're not going to be watching films like... Bambi versus Godzilla and Bambi three, the return of Thumper. <laughs> That's what he said. And everybody laughed. <laughs> uh, was good times. Yeah. And he obviously made that joke. Cause you know, he, he, he was like, he's like putzing around the room and he's like, what, what, what would you, what movie did you guys watch today? Oh, we watched Bambi. Oh, you were, you watching Bambi. Well, guess what? You guys are going into high school. You're going into high school. Bambi 3, The Return of Thumper. <laughs> Bambi versus Godzilla. Yeah, I think Bambi would win that fight. So we were in like in eighth grade and we were still watching these films. And it was it was just a nice time. And you know, it was it was just funny. That rant was so funny that he did. And I he was a memorable character, that teacher. Anyway, moving on. Spy kids. Unfortunately, my fucking sticker is blocking the kids part. But anyway, this was a huge, huge movie back in the 2000s when this came out. It was it was like James Bond, but with kids. And believe it or not, it was a new idea that no one had ever, ever, ever done before. Now, a lot of people make fun of these kids films like, oh, these are really stupid ideas like Air Bud and Space Jam. Spy kids. <laughs> but... Come on, like, what do you expect? Like, actually, when you really think about it, these are, these ideas have so much potential to be great. And Spy Kids was great. You know, Antonio Banderas. And the villain in the original first Spy Kids movie reminded me of, like, a demented Pee Wee Herman. This movie was funny. It was memorable. It was entertaining. And it had, had a good plot. And the stuff with the parents were funny. And... It was just a huge, huge, huge hit back in the 2000s. And some people forget about it, but at the time it was such a big deal and everybody watched it and got the toys and everything. And I always remembered Spy Kids and I'll never forget about it. <sighs> such a classic. And it's not made by Disney. Once again, Dimension Films. Everyone's like, oh, it's a Disney film. It's a no, it's not Disney. Shut the fuck up. Spy Kids 2, The Island of Lost Dreams is better arguably arguably better than the first movie it was just like really creative and the monsters they fought on the island were, were just like the monsters you'd see in like the old 50s movies yeah uh, out spies the original that's right the live action version of 101 dalmatians you guys remember this one how cool was this back in the day when they did this glenn close was such a an amazing Cruella de Vil. And she was kind of like the star of the movie. You know how they do all these like live action remakes of all the old animated Disney films from the 90s? This is like the first one. This is like the original version of all that stuff. But I thought this was a great idea to do it for this. They didn't have to do it with every fucking Disney movie like Lion King, Aladdin, all that shit. I thought this was an amazing movie. It's still funny. It's still, you know, weird and just like one of the most like brilliant ideas that Disney could have came up with. It was a huge hit when it came out and everybody kept talking about it. And I loved uh, the husband and wife in the film. They were really entertaining. It really felt like you were still watching those same characters from the original movie. And it had, uh, had differences from the original version too. So it almost felt like a sequel, which brings us to... The next movie, 102 Dalmatians. This was also another, uh, like, goddamn brilliant idea. Like, why not add one more Dalmatian? He has no spots, and it was, like, a big deal in the film, and he felt like an outcast. A lot of people think the second one is even better. The second one is better. It, it was amazing. It was even funnier. It was just wonderful. It was, like, really charming, and there's a warm, nostalgic, fuzzy feeling I have about 
remembering this when it came out in the 2000s and how much of a big deal it was. And Thumbelina, Warner Bros. Once again, like, this is a really good movie. They're trying to be Disney, but better than Disney. I, I remember feeling so nostalgic because I, I watched this as a kid so many times. And a lot of people have still have a lot of fond memories of this film. Yeah, like like this scene right here with, with the, the bird. That was really memorable. And it does remind me of Fern Gully. And it used to get me confused with Fern Gully because there's fairies in both of those movies. I wish they had sequels to it and all that. And, you know, Warner Brothers is no slouch. I mean, I know I give them a lot of credit in these, these retrospectives. But, you know, with, like, Cats Don't Dance and The Iron Giant and The Quest for Camelot, all these films, they did such a great job of being their own version of Disney. It wasn't just Space Jam. They had other great animated vo movies as well. And so is Thumbelina, a classic movie with an old folklore that Disney did not touch. The VeggieTales uh, are kind of different nowadays, but... They used to be more popular back in the 90s, and this is the big, the big uh, VeggieTales movie. Now, they, they had a lot of, you know, movies on tape that were, like, direct-to-video, but this was the one they, the, the, the big movie they released in the movie theaters at the time, and there was so many commercials, there was so many commercials, and it's called Jonah, a VeggieTales movie. They, they put so much effort into this film. And he gets stuck in the whale, and you know, it's the story from the Bible. That's what I always loved about VeggieTales, because I'm a born-again Christian, so it's nice to see a company that isn't satanic with their messages, and it's not always about the occult and everything. And it's like, yes, it's about the Bible. That's really cool, and to take a story like that, do like a fun, kitty vegetable version, and to keep, teach the kids a lesson, uh, you know, from lessons from the Bible... Big, I big idea didn't have much money. The ve the Veggie Tales were a big deal back in the '90s on the tape, and they were funny and everything. But unfortunately, Big Idea and if if I'm remembering this correctly, they went bankrupt after this movie because it didn't make as much money as they wanted it to make, and they put so much money into it, the marketing, and it wasn't it wasn't a huge hit that they wanted it to be. It's a great movie. And I really wish it, I really wish it was a bigger movie. I don't know what, like, that's such, such a sad story because after this movie came out, then another company bought the VeggieTales and after this movie, like the VeggieTales weren't as good as they used to be. So this film, like looking back is like the original version of VeggieTales is like last hurrah. And I really wish it wasn't like that. I really wish they would have kept going. And I just find the idea of the film intriguing. And don't you just love, like, the the rainbow foil on this tape? That's what they used to do with the trading cards back in the day. Lots of shiny boxes back in the day. You know, just like the Fantasia box had the gold lettering and, and the black. Well, this, you know, tried to do something different. Sorry about the dust, by the way. But when you own old VHS tapes, they get very dusty very quickly. The Thief and the Cobbler. I remember having a memory of walking around in Blockbuster back in the day, and I saw this on the shelf, and I always thought, oh, well, this, well, what is this, just some knockoff of, of Aladdin? Some crappy knockoff? Well, no, actually, this was in development long before Aladdin was ever created. So Aladdin was a giant knockoff of The Thief and the Cobbler. And there's a lot of great YouTube videos that talk about that and expose Disney once again for stealing ideas. It isn't exactly the same as Aladdin, and I do actually think Aladdin is a better movie, but it it's very, very close. I think this cover is pretty bad, I really have to say. Like, like this movie is really good, but the, the, the cover does not give it justice. And Miramax, for all you movie fans already know this, but Miramax is actually owned by Disney. It's a sub subsidiary of Disney. So what happened was Disney actually bought the rights to The Thief and the Cobbler, and they re-released it on tape. But I think they re-released it after Aladdin. So they basically bought their competition. And then they released Aladdin. And I think this came out around the same time as Aladdin. But this went nowhere. Because of course Disney wasn't going to market The Thief and the Cobbler. The film they ripped off. No. They want Aladdin. The movie they worked on to make more money than The Thief and the Cobbler. And they want to make The Thief and the Cobbler look stupid. You know, there's a, there's a scene in this film where the thief actually mentions Disneyland. So, you know, like Disney just completely just screwed them over. It was unfrickin' believable. 
it's a good movie and it was started in development in the 1960s and there's there, there's a lot of talk about all these scenes that uh, they never got to finish animating and they weren't in the final release musical sequences were changed and everything and a lot of fans of the thief and the cobbler complain that this is not the official like this isn't the true vision of the thief and the cobbler well i have to say is that even if the original version of the thief and the cobbler was released i still don't think it would have been like that much better like this movie isn't that good Uh, it's a little overrated i mean it's good it's not great but the animation is pretty stunning for the time period. And if it had been released maybe in the 60s or the 70s, it would have been a huge hit. It was just a, one of those really interesting cases where they worked on a film for like fucking 30 years. And it's like, come on, man. Just did, did you have to take that long to make it? I mean, it's interesting that they did that. But maybe work on a film for like 10 years or something. 30? Come on. Give me a break. Release the damn thing. You don't have to work on it for that long. It's just too long to wait. Oh man, there's so much I can say about this film. Wow, the Swan Princess. Everyone who grew up in the 90s, you know, once again, (laughs) I know I keep bringing up the 90s, but man, look at that color. All the animal characters were so memorable and funny in this film, especially him. This film is great, and it really, like, sucker-punched Disney in the gut because... This is, once again, just another major classic movie. And it was very similar to the princess films that Disney was doing. The jokes were funny. The animation was amazing. You know, paintings and everything. And the villain was really cool. And they had sequels to The Swan Princess. And even a couple of years ago, they were still making new sequels to it. And it's like, uh, the new ones are pretty crappy. But the old ones... The 90s ones, like the fir- the original Swan Princess trilogy were great. They were so great. The Swan Princess films are one of the best movie series of all time. Uh, mostly just people back in the day really under- really know and are huge fans of it. it. At the time, it really became like the land before time. At the time. <laughs> and it, it did because they kept making sequels to it. And it was like, oh, this is so awesome that it's its own thing. And... It's not Disney, and it's it's just legendary. It became legendary. It's so charming, and The Swan Princess is one of the best films of the 90s. But the second movie, The Swan Princess 2, was my absolute favorite. I thought that one was a masterpiece. That was better than the first, I thought. The third was good also, but that's really kind of where it ends, in my opinion, the other ones, I don't know. I, I saw some trailers for them, and I, I, I don't think they look that good. And even the fans don't think they're that good. But it, it's really interesting that they still kept making sequels like long after the 2000s for The Swan Princess. Just goes to show like how much you know the people who worked on the films really cared about these characters and what they built. Instead of just giving up on it, they just kept going. And it was such an amazing inspirational thing actually the the swan princess is often overlooked it's 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 not remembered as much as the other animated films of the 90s but that's because we kept drifting away from this guys we kept drifting away from 2d animation and and 2d animated feature films in the movie theaters we kept drifting and drifting and drifting and now we have all this trash if only we could go back guess is the this is the next best thing So everyone who's seen this film knows how amazing this film is and how funny it is. It's the funniest animated Disney film. Yzma, Krunk, Cusco. I mean, they're all hilarious in this film. John Goodman is the voice in it. It has quite a bit of adult jokes in it. And the humor is just, again, I know I keep saying how funny it is, but it really is funny. And they also had this terrible, like, uh, cartoon on it on Disney Channel. And I, I hated The Emperor's New School. I thought it sucked. Sucked! That's right, it did. And I never saw Krunk's New Groove, but maybe that's funny. I mean, Krunk's New Groove was direct-to-video. This was released in the movie theaters. And it was a mild hit at the time. I mean, everyone loved it at the time. I think it's just before Shrek, I think. And 
even though it's a Disney film, it is making fun of a lot of the corny childish things that were in other and the other Disney animated films. It kind of, it makes fun of that. And it's, it feels like more adult. This is like the most adult animated uh, Disney film that, that, that kind of pokes fun of what they've done in a way that, in a way where it's not disgracing it like uh, Conquer's Bad Fur Day did to Conquer the Squirrel. But it's, you know, it's like, in a, it's done in a charming way. It would have been cool if they did something else with uh, the sequels to Emperor, The Emperor's New Groove instead of, you know, Krunk's New Groove and that terrible TV show. But, you know, that's what we got and it's whatever. Yzma is like the funniest, one of the, maybe the funniest like female villain in all of like cinema. Ah, uh, Krunk! It's just so many great moments and he's always like, yeah, weird. Crunk was hilarious, and the voices are great in this film. David Spade was Cusco, John Goodman. I, I don't remember who did the voice for Yzma, but I thought Yzma was hilarious when she, she got turned to the cat with the spells at the end, and she was like, ha, 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 ha. You know, this is good times, guys. This is like the end of the 2D animated films, you know. <sighs> like, if only this kept going, and it was a golden age. It really was sad, but true. So here we have the original 101 Dalmatians movie. Yay. From the 60s, I think the original version came out. And again, like I said, I loved the husband and wife. I think the, the father was called Pago or Pogo or something. Or maybe that was the wife's name. I don't remember. Yeah. What can I say? I mean, I talked about the Dalmatians earlier, the live action version. And the original is classic. Yeah, I, I love the maid character and the, the the goons for Cruella de Vil remind me of the two goons from Home Alone. They kind of look the same too. You know, one is like taller than the other and whatever. The, my favorite character though, um, aside from the, the father dog, was pretty much the, the husband in the film. He was this artsy guy and he always played piano and he danced and sang and he like he was like maybe a painter or something in the film and he kept having a sense of humor and he it reminds me of me. He makes, he made this song in the film that be, that's become famous to Dalmatian fans and it's Cruella de Vil, Cruella de Vil, Cruella, Cruella de Vil. Very memorable moment in the film where she's about to walk in the room and Cruella de Vil became one of the most like, evil female characters of all time up there with angelica and whoever else you know from the rugrats and it makes sense that they did more ideas with it i'm so glad that they did that and it, i think this film contributed to dalmatians becoming popular so this is definitely one of the best dog movies of all time and maybe to some fans it is ah the grand finale check it out guys this is gargoyles the movie the heroes awaken. So basically I'm a huge gargoyles fan and it used to be a huge thing in the nineties. It was like the new Ninja turtles. I think the gargoyles were cooler than the turtles. It was like really interesting and it's like Gothic and cool and adult. And the, there's a lot of adult, uh, gargoyles fans, even in the nineties, like it's for kids and adults. It's like the perfect combo of kids and adults loving the same thing. I remember they used to have conventions in the 90s where the voice actors for like Goliath and the main gargoyle and the other characters were there. And the fan base for gargoyles became like the fan base for Star Trek. You know, like the characters in the gargoyles were like the were like Batman. They had emotional stories cuz it was a cartoon, right, on Disney Channel. And this is basically the first episode. This is the pilot for the gargoyles. But they renamed it and called it the movie and released it on VHS. And I don't care about that. I mean, it's awesome. And I, you know, I, I loved this as a kid. I used to look at the tape and I rewatched this so many times. And I had all the, I had all the toys. I had all the action figures. I'll try to show you guys some photographs. But once again, what I said, what I, tr I should have showed this in my VHS video that uh, stuff we've missed and we, we lost look how huge the tape is it's bigger than the other tapes why because it's the fucking gargoyles they like made it look awesome the tape is bigger you know and it has an interactive board game on here where you where you can insert this other VHS tape and stuff like that 
So the gargoyles were pretty much like the X-Men, you know. And it also reminded me of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. The gargoyles came alive in that movie and they were hilarious. They were really cool. And that was like them, you know, they, they came, they come out at night to solve crimes. Kind of like the PJ masks. <laughs> but anyway, you open it up. The gargoyles is one of the coolest things Disney ever did. And it's really interesting because it, it, it's similar to the Mighty Ducks cartoon. Both the gargoyles and the Mighty Ducks cartoon were fucking amazing guys. They should bring back the goddamn gargoyles because this my friends is one of the coolest vhs tape boxes of all time thanks for watching guys i i love you all i appreciate you all please leave me some comments i will continue to make these and complete my nostalgic childhood collection of vhs tapes we're not done yet not by a long shot baby the 90s will live on forever and so will goliath Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this retrospective of the fourth row. Such nostalgia. I mean, every fucking video just has so many memories. So many thoughts just rush to your mind. Just looking at the box and then you think about, oh yeah, I remember where I was when I watched that. Very warm and fuzzy. May the 90s be with you forever, friends. Catch you later.